Hi everyone, this is Vivek Kulkarni with USMLE RX, and in this section, we'll be talking about pathology. You might not realize it by looking at the size of the section, but pathology is an incredibly important topic. It not only encompasses about half of what you'll likely see on your exam, but it's also the core of medicine, the basis for what you will see on the wards and beyond. This chapter lays the groundwork for understanding pathology and underscores the systems-based pathology at the heart of your medical school learning. We'll be going through the pathology section of the book page by page. We'll explain some of the harder concepts and use images to drive things home. On the other hand, some of the information just needs to be memorized, and we'll give pointers to help you with that. Along the way, we'll use questions and mini-cases to test understanding, and hopefully, by the end, you'll have a better sense for the important topics in pathology and how to apply them on your exam. Let's start with apoptosis. Apoptosis is programmed cell death, which in a crude sense is clean cellular suicide. To keep everything clean, it requires ATP. There are two ways that a cell can do this, the intrinsic or the extrinsic pathway. We'll get to those soon, but regardless of the pathway, the most important thing about apoptosis is that there is no significant inflammation. Once the apoptotic pathway begins, the nucleus and cell membrane go through predictable changes, each of which has a funny-sounding Greek name. In English, the nucleus shrinks, fragments, and fades away, while the membrane blebs and ultimately forms packets of cellular contents called apoptotic bodies. Since the intracellular contents are confined to those bodies, they are readily eaten up by macrophages. There's no chance for cellular contents to get out and cause trouble. As I said before, the two pathways to get apoptosis started are the intrinsic and extrinsic pathways. Both pathways end in the activation of cytosolic caspases, the killer enzymes that degrade the entire cell. The intrinsic pathway gets activated when the normal balance of pro-apoptotic proteins and anti-apoptotic proteins is shifted. There are tons of these proteins, but the two ones listed here are common and important to know, especially BCL2, because it plays a role in certain cancers. Once the balance is shifted, the mitochondria leak cytochrome C, which activates the killer caspases. Some examples of the intrinsic pathway occurring in normal life are during embryogenesis, when structures like Mullerian ducts in males degenerate, as well as menstruation and atrophy. On the other hand, the extrinsic pathway is activated, as the name suggests, from the outside. The cell receives a signal that directly leads to activation of the killer caspases without involving the pro- and anti-apoptotic protein. The three signals listed here, FAS ligand, granzyme B, and perforin, are all employed by immune cells, including killer T cells, to cleanly and quickly destroy cells that don't belong. Now that we understand apoptosis, it's easy to see why necrosis is so much worse. Necrosis is cell death that results from enzymes destroying a cell in a chaotic mess. Whereas apoptosis uses ATP to allow for a clean cellular suicide, necrosis is more like sloppy cellular massacre. Intracellular components actually leak out into the tissue and cause inflammation, whereas apoptosis is more like a targeted strike mission by Navy SEALs, efficient, clean, and with no collateral damage. Necrosis is more like an aerial bombing, messy, and with lots of damage to things nearby. Since necrosis is so chaotic, there are different ways it can happen in the body, depending on the location. As we go through the six types, we'll highlight some of the important microscopic and macroscopic features of each one, and hopefully we won't get lost in the details. Coagulative necrosis occurs in the heart, liver, and kidneys, which are all solid organs with strong connective tissue. It's as if the underlying connective tissue holds everything in place and allows the necrotic material and incoming blood to form a discrete clot-like mass. On the other hand, liquefactive necrosis happens in places where there isn't any strong connective tissue to keep things solid. The brain, bacterial abscesses, and pleural effusion. All of these things end up looking like pus. Yes, they're necrotic, but liquefied. Next, caseous necrosis is particularly important to remember. Luckily, it's also easy to remember, because caseous literally means cheese-like which is exactly what a gross specimen of caseous necrosis looks like. 
Microscopically, the classic example is a granuloma, which are organized accumulations of necrotic debris. Typically, you would see this in tuberculosis, but it can also happen in systemic fungal infections. Moving on to number four, fatty necrosis happens in pancreatitis, when pancreatic lipase digests surrounding fat, leading to a frothy mix of lipid and water-soluble contents. In fact, the word saponification means soap forming, and the fatty necrosis that occurs is just like the lather that comes from mixing water and lipids in soap. Fifth, we have fibrinoid necrosis, which typically happens to blood vessels in the setting of vasculitis. The way to think of this one is just like the name suggests, something that looks like fibrin. Last but not least, and probably most disgusting, is gangrenous necrosis. This is basically when tissue completely loses its blood supply and starts to just wither away. In dry gangrene, that's the end of it, which is still pretty disgusting. But in wet gangrene, bacteria make their entrance and destroy everything in sight, leading to a gooey, pussy mess. Gangrene often happens in the limbs, like in diabetics who have foot infections that get amputated, and in the GI tract in the case of intestinal ischemia. Great, now that we know the two main ways cells can die, let's look at the process of cellular injury. What happens when cells are deprived of oxygen? Some of the changes that take place can be reversed if the cell gets oxygen back, but eventually the cell gets so injured that there's no way of coming back, and the changes are irreversible. Now let's try to understand what the point of no return is here. The underlying problem with cell injury is the inability to make enough ATP to do what the cells need to do. This table shows the changes of cell injury that are reversible and the ones that are irreversible. As you look them over, can you think of the most important difference between the two groups? Here's a hint. It has to do with phospholipid bilayers. Basically, in order for the changes of cell injury to become irreversible, there has to be a breakdown in normal intracellular barriers, specifically in membranes. Once any of these membranes, nuclear membrane, plasma membrane, or mitochondrial membrane, gets destroyed, the cell can't keep its contents separated, and it quickly dies. On the other hand, if the membranes are still intact, the cell can still recover if it regains the ability to make ATP, which can be restored with oxygen. Now that we understand how individual cells respond to hypoxia, let's think about how hypoxia affects whole areas of the body. Certain tissues are more susceptible to hypoxia than others. The reason is because certain areas are perfused by blood with lots of oxygen, and others are perfused by blood with less oxygen. For example, watershed areas, or areas that receive blood supply from the distalmost branches of two arteries, receive relatively oxygen-poor arterial blood from both sources. Any decrease in blood pressure will prevent these areas from getting adequate oxygen, including the splenic flexure and areas in the brain. Similarly, the subendocardium in the heart, the proximal tubule in the kidney, as well as the thick ascending limb, and the area around the central vein in the liver all receive distal blood supply, making them susceptible to hypoxia. In addition, all neurons are susceptible to hypoxia probably because they require so much oxygen that even a normal blood supply is still pretty delicate. Let's move on now to infarction, which is tissue death that results from complete ischemia. In gross specimens, infarction can either look red or pale, depending on the organ type. If infarcted tissue can still receive blood via collaterals, the infarct will be red or hemorrhagic. On the other hand, if the infarcted tissue doesn't have any collaterals, it will be pale. Pretty straightforward. Red infarcts are ones where there is still blood. One important thing to keep in mind is that myocardial infarctions, which are normally pale, can sometimes appear red because they were reperfused during treatment. This restores blood flow, hence the red color, but the reperfusion can also cause free radical damage to the tissue. 